Good evening, everyone. It's uh, uh, evening for me because I'm talking to you from Haifa in Israel, where I live. Uh, and I'm going to tell, uh, tell you about um, my family, the Sfadi uh, Lisbona family from Damascus. As Tom explained, I uh, called this presentation from glory to dispersion because there was certainly a glorious time in the past. And in the way of Jewish history, uh, the family dispersed to all corners of the world. Um, I, I must say I'm a little nervous. I'm not used to giving presentations. Um, and I have the impression that some of you are more knowledgeable about genealogy than I am. But uh, so uh, help me out. And I'll, of course, be happy to answer questions and to hear any corrections you might have or suggestions for future research at the end. So let me start out by saying uh, that I'm uh, uh, very lucky in several respects. Uh, one is that some unusual things happened to the family uh, on the way, which got recorded in, in history, uh, because um, as you will hear, conventional genealogy sources that we know in the West of vital records are uh, hard to come by um, in, the, uh, in the Middle East. Um, um, my sort of greatest advantage, if you like, is in having a fairly unique name, uh, which is uh, Lisbona, um, which doesn't necessarily mean that everybody who's called Lisbona is uh, from the same family. But uh, amazingly enough, all the Lisbonas that I've managed to trace all over the world, and there are about 3,000 of them uh, today, all fit in one of two family trees from Damascus. So we'll be looking a little at the history of the family um, at the uh, Bet Lisbona, the famous uh, Lisbona mansion that was built in, in Damascus, which is a cornerstone of much of the history. Um, we'll look at the, at the migrations, where Lisbonas were at different times and where they dispersed to um, uh, ultimately. Um, uh, I'll talk a little about uh, sources and uh, uh, resource, uh, research challenges. So let's start out by considering this question of the name. Uh, Lisbon uh, is the capital of Portugal and Lisbona is the Italian for Lisbon, for the capital of Portugal. And Lisbona has no other meaning in any other language. Uh, so we have the assumption, as we have in so many other cases where we know of uh, Sfadi and also Ashkenazi families that got their names from the places they came. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, Sfadis, the De Leons from the uh, Spanish kingdom of Castile Leon, uh, the, probably the, one of the most famous uh, Sfadi names, which comes from a place is to, are the Toledanos uh, from the problem, province of uh, Toledo in Spain. So as I say, we have the, uh, the working assumption that the Lisbonas came from uh, Lisbon. And because Lisbona is Lisbon in Italian, uh, that they got the name uh, in, in Italy. Um, so um, we found um, a few Lisbonas in Italy in the 1500s and 1600s. There was a Rabbi Moshe Lisbona in Rome uh, from the uh, Ketubot that they have in Livorno in Italy, which was a major Jewish center. Uh, there were some Lisbonas there. Uh, later, we'll hear a little more about the connection of the Damascus Lisbona families with, uh, with Venice. Um, uh, we'll hear about the first recorded documentation we have of Lisbonas from Damascus. And then we know much more about them during 200 years or so uh, in Damascus. And they were in Damascus, in Syria, um, until the uh, foundation of the State of Israel in 
1948. Um, as I said, there were two branches. Uh, some of them were very different, uh, 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 definitely wealthy merchants. Um, the earliest documents we have are from 1780, and we'll be looking at those. Um, and uh, it's quite clear that the Lisbona, Lisbonas from Damascus were what, were what was known as Senores Francos, meaning these were um, uh, of Sephardi origin, Jews of Sephardi origin, as opposed to the local Middle Eastern indigenous uh, Mustarabi uh, Jews. Um, my great-grandfather, um, Abraham Lisbona, uh, left in 1875 from Damascus to uh, Egypt, and his brother went to uh, Manchester. Uh, later Lisbonas who stayed on uh, in Damascus uh, emigrated to Lebanon, Mexico, Argentina, and uh, Palestine. The, uh, the first documentation we have about the Lisbonas uh, relates to uh, the uh, story that you will have heard of, of, of the false messiah, Shabtai Tzvi, um, who lived in the uh, Middle East in the mid 17th century. And what is the Lisbona connection? Um, uh, in the, his various historical books about Shabtai Tzvi, the false messiah. The story is told that there was a wealthy Portuguese Jew uh, called uh, Samuel Lisbona in Damascus, um, who had a, a very beautiful uh, daughter who had one uh, defect, physical defect, that she was one-eyed, and he had a trouble in finding a husband for her. Uh, and he heard that there were good Jewish men in Gaza, and at the time there was a very lively Jewish community in Gaza. So he, Samuel Lisbona, the, the Portuguese Jew from Damascus, moved to Gaza, um, met up with a famous rabbi there, Rabbi Haggis, who recommended um, one Nathan Benjamin Levy, um, he married um, Samuel Lisbona's uh, daughter and shortly afterwards met Shabtai Tzvi. The story says that he became absolutely ecstatic. Some people say that he lost his mind completely, but the important thing was that he declared uh, Shabtai Tzvi to be uh, the, the, the Messiah and uh, became one of his major disciples uh, for the rest of his life. Um, uh, let's have a look at um, the migrations of the Lisbonas. So, as we said, presumed to have started in uh, Lisbon, Portugal, and having left there at the time of the exodus uh, from Portugal in 1497. Um, as I say, there are definitely traces of Lisbonas in Rome, and in Livorno, and um, we will see the Venice connection. I've also seen uh, Lisbonas being mentioned up until the 20th century in Thessaloniki, in Greece, in Saloniki, and also in Izmir, in Smyrna, uh, in Turkey. Uh, but the major traces we have of my family are in Syria, mostly in uh, Damascus, but some, some also in Aleppo. Um, later from Damascus, they then uh, moved to other places. Uh, there was one um, uh, Lisbona who moved to Tiberias and died there. Uh, in the uh, Montefiore census that was done in the Holy Land, in the 1850s or so, there are several Damascus Lisbonas listed as living in the now Palestinian town of Nablus in the West Bank. Uh, we've already mentioned Gaza. And then at a later stage in history, uh, 
there was a mass exodus, we can say, of Lisbonas and other Jews from uh, Syria to Egypt, both to Alexandria and to uh, Cairo. Um, I want to say a few things about the uh, sources that I've used. Um, uh, the most tangible original sources are various documents we have from the uh, Venetian consulate in Aleppo, the consulate in Aleppo of the Republic of Venice, and I'll be talking a little about this. A uh, very significant contribution was made by a British woman called Lydia Collins, um, who together with her partner um, and with financing from the Dweck family um, about 20 years ago produced a hugely impressive book called The Sfadiman of Manchester, which tells the absolutely amazing story about considerable numbers of um, Sephardi merchants who move from the Middle East, primarily from Syria, uh, but also from Iraq and Turkey uh, to uh, Manchester in the mid 19th century, probably almost certainly because Manchester, Manchester was such a central point of the world, cotton trade and the whole, the cotton mills in Lancashire in the, in the, in the UK. Um, significant research was done also in the 1990s by uh, two uh, Frenchmen of uh, uh, Middle Eastern Jewish descent, uh, Maurice Hazan and Remy Hakim. Uh, here you can see uh, the uh, entry for the name Lisbona under a number of different uh, spellings uh, from the uh, uh, Sephardi Dictionary of Names, which is a, always a, a useful starting point to have a look at where, uh, where people of certain names either came from or, or, or landed up in. And we see here Beirut, Lebanon, Alexandria, Smyrna, Izmir, Rio de Janeiro, because then later many of them came to, uh, to Brazil and we'll get to that. A really important resource is the incredibly valuable website which has been created by Alain Farhi, um, uh, uh, called Les Fleurs de Lorient. Um, uh, of course, there's a lot that you can find in different sources of the, on, the, on the internet. I've mentioned the, the Jewish Chronicle where you can find uh, interesting things at least relating to, uh, to British Jews. Um, an unusual source I had was from a Palestinian woman, an, an American Palestinian academic who researches uh, Muslim Sharia court records and she went through Sharia court records uh, from Damascus and found uh, several Lisbonas who were witnesses in uh, court cases in, in uh, Damascus in the Sharia courts, mostly relating to um, uh, property issues. Um, I'll talk in a little a while about an interesting British woman called Isabel Burton and we'll see how various art books have produced, uh, given us uh, lots of information about the, uh, the Maison Lisbona, the Beit Lisbona uh, in Damascus. Um, here again, just to get an impression of the wealth of information there is on Alain Farhi's website, Les Fleurs de Lorient, you see uh, just the first page of, of Lisbona's uh, that he has, some from Damascus, some from Alexandria, some from uh, Aleppo. Uh, so I'd like to talk a little, first of all, give you a little sort of wider picture about the importance of uh, uh, Damascus. First of all, you have to remember that the, at its height, the uh, Ottoman Empire was huge. Look at the, the map, the green part of the map to see how huge the uh, Ottoman Empire uh, was at its height with a huge amount of trade and 
Damascus right in the middle of it. Um, Damascus was known already from much earlier times as being on the Silk Road um, trade route from Europe to, uh, to China, and it maintained an important trading position until the middle of the 19th century. Uh, in addition, um, uh, Hajj caravans, people making the Muslims making the Hajj to Medina and Mecca from anywhere in the northern part of the Ottoman Empire would start their pilgrimages from Damascus. Uh, similarly, there were Christian pilgrimages to Jerusalem, which for whom, again, um, Damascus was an important uh, staging point. Uh, let's talk a little about the, the Jews of Syria. They were there from biblical times. We know from, from the time of, the, of, of King David, I've already mentioned that both Damascus and Aleppo were major centers of trade and, and, and pilgrimage to, to Jerusalem and Mecca. The first record we have of the population, Jewish population of Damascus was about 3,000 uh, provided by Benjamin Metudela uh, in the 12th century. Uh, the numbers did not go up very much um, uh, until uh, the, uh, the 18th or 19th century, even in the middle of the 19th century, only about 4,000 uh, Jews in Damascus. There were, as I've said, there were basically two types or classes of Jews, the Mustarabi Jews, who were dhimmis, who were subject to Muslim law and to had to pay uh, a, a poll tax, uh, while the uh, Francos, who were basically the Sfadi immigrants from the Iberian Peninsula, uh, uh, almost all had European pr protection, which means they had nationality from one of the European states, um, uh, France, Austria, uh, the Republic of Venice. Um, there were a number of very uh, important and very wealthy Jewish families in uh, Damascus. And according to local histories which have been written in Syria, uh, they say that those uh, uh, rich Jewish families during the 18th and 19th centuries were the dominant factors in, in trade um, uh, in Syria. Uh, in time, and we'll talk about this in a, in a little while, the uh, Syria's fortunes fell um, slowly, slowly, uh, there, were, there was more and more anti-Jewish uh, sentiment. Um, uh, in 1936, there was quite an attack uh, on Zionism. Of course, there was huge anti-Israel feeling after the War of Independence. And by 1978, there were only 1,500 1, uh, Jews left in, in, in Damascus. Um, the major emigrations were to uh, Lebanon, Palestine, um, North and South America. The community more or less existed, a small number, a few hundred people until 1992, when there was a kind of window of opportunity that through American pressure, um, the then president of Syria, Hafez al-Assad, allowed uh, Jews to leave. Uh, also, some managed to get out to, uh, uh, to Israel. Um, if we look at uh, where Jews from Syria are now, we see there are almost none at all left in Syria. The vast majority uh, made it to uh, Israel, also a significant number uh, to the USA, and the rest to um, uh, uh, South and, and Central America, uh, most of them going uh, through Lebanon. Um, I want to say a few words about the 
uh, the position of uh, Syria and Egypt, because in, in so many ways, um, Syria was the, 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 the center of the, the Arab world, let's say, uh, during the, uh, up to the 19th century. Um, and then slowly Egypt became, began to become the, the dominant force. And this is primarily due to one man uh, who was uh, Muhammad Ali. Um, and uh, Muhammad Ali was in fact um, of uh, um, origin from Kosovo, from Albania, uh, which gives you an idea of the spread of the Ottoman Empire. There was actually a guy who came from there who uh, uh, joined the Ottoman forces and he was the one who managed to throw the Napoleonic forces out of Egypt. Napoleon had uh, invaded Egypt in uh, 1798 and uh, Muhammad Ali managed to uh, throw the, the French Napoleon's army out as a result of which he became uh, Viceroy of uh, Egypt with the uh, the, the rank of, of Pasha, and he then basically was the ruler of Egypt from 1805 to um, uh, 1848. And uh, Muhammad Ali was very, um, I would say, unusual for his time and, and the area in that he was very open. Uh, he, uh, he was very favorable to the Jews when he, he conquered Syria in 1831. So we see in the course of the 19th century a, uh, a move of gradual decline in Syria um, and through um, Muhammad Ali's opening Egypt up, welcoming immigration from all parts of Europe, uh, from Italy, from Greece, Christians, Jews, uh, others from the Balkans, um, the, uh, the, the fortunes of, the Otto, of, of Syria declined uh, for several reasons. One were the financial problems that the Ottoman Empire had. Um, they basically had uh, uh, a big economic crisis in 1875, um, which resulted in people leaving Syria. And of course, probably the most significant change was that in 1869, the Suez Canal was opened, which completely changed the trade situation in the Middle East. And suddenly, instead of uh, uh, Damascus being a ma major trade point on the way to Asia, suddenly uh, most trade to Asia was going through the Suez Canal. And of course, Egypt was also opening up its it's Suez Canal. So what we see is uh, many Jews, including most of the Lisbona family, left Syria from Egypt in the late 19th century and uh, settled in Egypt. Egypt had the most incredible thriving uh, uh, community uh, during the first half of the 20th century. Most of the Jews arrived from uh, starting in the late 1900s, uh, but then the Jewish community had to leave, including my family, um, had to leave either in 1948 at the foundation of the State of Israel or 56 at the time of the, the Suez crisis, which again produced a lot of anti-Jewish sentiment or uh, the Six-Day War, and they then left uh, to uh, Israel, to France, to the USA, to Brazil. So, so we see this movement that the, the, uh, the Jews, the Lisbonas, had come uh, probably sometime uh, at the beginning of the 1700s um, from Italy to Syria. They were in Syria for about 200 years. They had to leave Syria uh, to Egypt, where they were had lived good life, for 50 years and then uh, uh, dispersed in the, in the rest of the world. 
I want to go back a bit, uh, however, and talk a little about the Republic of Venice, uh, because we'll have to understand how it's important. Very few people are aware that Venice was an ind independent republic for uh, 1100 years, from 697 until 1797, uh, when it was taken over by uh, Napoleonic France. And uh, Venice was basically uh, succeeded as an independent republic as a result of the, the, the trading that they did with the whole of the uh, uh, Middle East. And they were so successful <coughs> as a trading nation uh, that, as you can see from this map, at various periods during, during history, the Venetian Republic also basically included uh, parts of Montenegro, bits of what were Yugoslavia, including major bits of uh, Greece, the Peloponnese, uh, the island of Crete, uh, even the whole area of uh, Constantinople, uh, Istanbul uh, for, a for a time, were all part of the overseas possessions of the Republic uh, of Venice. Uh, so why is the Republic of Venice important for our story? It's important for our story because basically they're the major source of documentation um, uh, about uh, uh, the family. Um, one of the Lisbonas in uh, London inherited from her father who had inherited from his grandfather, okay, uh, a whole pile of documents dating from the 1700s and the 1800s, uh, which were uh, either applications to the uh, consulate in Aleppo of the Republic of Venice, that's where they had their consulate, um, or documents that they produced. The, the first document that we uh, have is from uh, 1780, which is basically a laissez-passer. In those days, um, uh, passports didn't exist in the way they, we know they do now. Uh, so when um, uh, people uh, like merchants, the Lisbona merchant family wanted to travel in the Middle East and they wanted to have protection from the European powers in the various uh, cities and countries they would uh, might go. They basically appealed to the uh, Venetian consulate in Aleppo to get this letter, let's call it a letter of good standing. And, and, and here it says the uh, uh, notary Celesio Rizzini um, uh, on behalf of the Serene Republic of, Ve of Venice, La Serenissima Repubblica di Venezia the consul general of in Aleppo, Syria, Palestine. He attests and certifies that Raphael Chaim Lisbona, uh, domiciled in Damascus and a citizen of the Serene Republic of um, uh, uh, Venice presented his credentials. And uh, he basically asks anybody who sees this letter to uh, grant um, Raphael Chaim Lisbona, good passage. Um, obviously at times, in order to get these uh, letters of safe conduct, uh, the uh, uh, Lisbonas had to justify themselves. And in one of his applications, this Raphael Chaim, Chaim Lisbona writes, aside from my dealings as a businessman, I offer my assistance to all Venetian pilgrims on their way to the Holy Land. So, you know, in theory, Christian Venetian pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem could get a cup of coffee in the Beit Lisbona in, uh, uh, in Damascus um, on the way. So uh, let's have a look at um, what is known as branch one of the Lisbonas. Um, um, branch one is I'll call it my branch. This is this uh, Chaim de Rafael Lisbona, who is the uh, who we saw in the previous 
document. So he's the first one we actually have uh, uh, documentation regarding his, uh, his existence. His grandson was my great grandfather, um, Abraham Lisbona, who emigrated from uh, Damascus in 1875 to Alexandria in Egypt, where all his seven children were born. Um, and uh, so you see basically these all these families were in, in, uh, in Egypt uh, were in Egypt until they had to leave Egypt. Um, uh, some of them at some point moved to the, uh, uh, to the, to the United States. Um, there's an interesting story here with this Clementine Lisbona who was married to a lawyer in um, uh, Cairo called Leon Castro. And Leon Castro had the innovative idea in 1934 that by international law, he could bring a civil lawsuit against um, Adolf Hitler. Well, he didn't, he didn't actually manage to get um, uh, very far with that, but he had his, his uh, sort of uh, uh, five minutes of fame uh, there. Uh, from this branch, um, they ended up in New York and, and Florida and are there um, until, uh, until this day. Um, um, uh, again, here again, there was a branch of there. I mean, they, they stayed in, uh, in basically in Egypt. This branch um, at some point moved to France and they're mostly in, in, in France now. And this is my um, uh, grandfather uh, uh, who had two sons, only one side, son uh, survived and that was my father and we'll look at that a little uh, later. The other, uh, um, uh, as I said, the, um, my uh, great grandfather, Abram Lisbona had one brother um, and uh, his brother was Moses Lisbona and at the same time that Abraham Lisbona moved from um, Damascus to uh, Alexandria in Egypt, Moses Lisbona moved to Manchester. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any documentation to the precise exp uh, uh, explanation why at, at the same time one brother moved to um, uh, Manchester and the other um, uh, moved to Alexandria. Certainly Egypt was uh, very much uh, developed, uh, developing and um, Abraham Lisbona in Egypt was definitely involved in the textile business. Uh, Moses Lisbona was a ship's charterer and again this may well have to do with the uh, the cotton trade. Uh, if we look at the other major branch of the Lisbonas in uh, Damascus, and uh, uh, this is this one of whom the most uh, famous descendant scion was uh, uh, Maya Lisbona, and we'll talk about it in, in a minute. As I say, I don't have any documentation proving that the two Lisbona branches were uh, related, uh, but I have done uh, uh, a Y-DNA test and asked one member of the, um, this branch, whose name is also David Lisbona, who is a lawyer in Canada, uh, to, and he's taken a, a family tree DNA, Y-DNA test, and we are uh, closely related by DNA, so we just don't know exactly uh, how. So let's talk a little about um, Maya Lisbona. Maya Lisbona's main uh, claim to fame was that he was the one who built uh, the Lisbona mansion, which we'll talk about uh, in a little while, which was one of the most um, extravagant uh, mansions, let's say, in uh, 
Damascus to the extent that it was uh, recorded in, in many different places. Um, and because it was such a big and beautiful house, it uh, hosted important meetings. And here we have a photograph taken from in one of the rooms of the uh, um, uh, Bet Lisbona. Uh, and here is uh, uh, Mayor Lisbona, and you can see him here on the right, an enlarged picture. And this picture is of a meeting in 1905 with the Chacham Bashi. Chacham Bashi was the name given to the Grand Rabbi of the Ottoman Empire, the, basically the chief rabbi of the whole of the Ottoman Empire, um, who at that time was uh, Chaim Nahum Effendi, uh, who was an extremely important uh, character, and he uh, visited the various communities. And so here we have this record of his, him sitting and meeting with the notables of the Jewish community in, in Damascus, in uh, one of the rooms of the uh, uh, Lisbona house. Here we have the first photograph of the Maison Lisbona or the Beit Lisbona. Um, which, we, which is in 1859, which is pretty, pretty amazing if you think about it. Uh, photography only really started pretty much in the middle of the uh, uh, 19th century. Um, uh, and uh, there was a, an archeological mission to the Middle East. And there was a young Frenchman called Louis Leclerc who joined this mission and he had a, a technical bent and a camera. And so he took this first uh, photograph of the um, uh, Lisbona house. And we'll see other, you will remember the picture of this arch. And if we fast forward to 1984, you see the same arch and uh, the window is slightly different, but basically you can see the the, the main courtyard of the house. Uh, and this picture was taken uh, together with many others in 1984 by a, um, uh, a Muslim professor of Islamic art from MIT. Um, and we will see that the Lisbona house, in fact, is considered to be one of the great examples of Islamic art. I mean, it, uh, it's, uh, it's quite amusing that uh, a house, and we'll see that other major Jewish houses in uh, Damascus also were con considered prime examples of Jewish art. And now, if we fast forward again, and really the most amazing picture, if you kind of look at the contrast, here, this picture is of a school class in the Beit Lisbona uh, in 1991, just before the community finally was basically uh, 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 wrapped up. Um, the last school, I mean, as I, I told you, there had been continuing emigration of Jews uh, from Damascus, but uh, the Alliance, the Alliance Israelite, continued maintaining a school, and the last school in the Jewish community in, in Damascus was in the Bet Lisbona, uh, and you can see part of the ornate uh, decorations on the on the walls. Um, I. Let's have a look at what was written about this house. And to explain this, we have, um, we're very fortunate to have uh, the journal or a book um, produced by a woman called Isabel Burton. Lady Isabel Burton was the wife of the uh, British ambassador to Syria uh, in the late 19th century. Um, and she basically traveled around the whole Middle East and uh, uh, told stories of her travels. 
uh, we must remember that the 19th century was the great period of French and British exploration of the Near East. And reading travelogues and descriptions of the exotic Middle East was a favorite uh, pastime in Europe. Uh, uh, so she talks about her tour of houses in, 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 uh, in uh, <laughs> and, um, and writes, now we will ride to the Jewish quarter and visit Hawaja, Lisbona. Hawaja is a kind of uh, a noble term, a term of, of dignity. You know, it's like Sir something, Lisbona. One of the wealthiest, which is wealthy face, faith. He has the most beautiful house, save one in Damascus. Um, uh, she mentions that the entrance to the house is very, very modest with a, a narrow winding passage, uh, which precede riches and beauty. So this is again, one of the fascinating uh, uh, paradoxes. The uh, Jewish quarter in the old city of Damascus was completely closed off. It only had one entrance, uh, but there were these very wealthy Jewish families who lived in the Jewish quarter. Uh, but their Jew, their houses were not visible from the outside. And, uh, you know, this may be because the, the Jews did not want to show off in some way to the uh, Ottomans and to the, and, to the, and to the Muslims. But as soon as people entered the courtyard of the house, and it was a huge house, we'll see in a minute, it had 19 uh, uh, rooms. And it says the house is in the form of a square and appears to be richly ornamented. A, a beautiful pa paved court stands before us with large marble fountains and their goldfish, orange and lemon trees, uh, jessamine and other perfumed shrubs. Uh, um, uh, it's all very, very luxurious. Um, the stone pavement and raised dice are covered with velvet and gold cushions on three sides. The walls are a mass of mosaics in gold, ebony, and mother of pearl with tiny marble uh, columns. And I think, you know, we'll have a look in a minute at the pictures. By today's standards, we would, in, we would consider it incredibly kitschy. Uh, but uh, Mayor Lisbona obviously amassed a huge fortune, and this was his. This was what he did with his uh, money. Um, uh, as I've told you, um, these uh, houses are uh, basically magnificent, and they are considered to be amongst the the most significant. Um, 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 elements of uh, Islamic uh, architecture. Um, and uh, we'll just have a look in a in a middle. If you look at, and this is a book that appeared. Sorry, I'm having a problem with my screen. I'm just going to try and fix. Sorry about this interruption. Don't worry, technical technical errors are, are, are part of our, our USP. Um, hang on, I think I may have to, I'm really sorry about this, I may have to restart. Please do. No worries. Well, whilst you're um, doing that, I'd, I'd just like to say that uh, both uh, Alain Fahi and Lydia Collins, who are two of the experts that you mentioned, uh, are, are with us today, and we're very happy to have them. And, and also Serena Rossi, who's, who's done a huge amount of uh, 
research and uh, good in uh, Sephardic genealogy. Would you would you like to go to, um, to questions now? I think he restarted his computer, so he might not even be on. Mm. I think you're right. I think we've lost our speaker. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <the best. laughs> He'll be back. Uh, Elaine, what was that um, book that was put out that was about Beit Farhi in Damascus? We went to that lecture by that um, professor. Um, we shall, we shall hopefully see that in a second. I will post it. Okay, and um, I think we have our, our speaker back. Mm -hmm. I will just double check if he is um, unmuted. This is the first time we lost the speaker. I think we have our speaker back again. Yes, yes, yes you have the you have the speaker back. <laughs> uh, hang on, just one second, and I'll be. I will have the slides back because these are the slides that are worth looking at because they are really quite um, uh, uh, quite magnificent. So here. Uh, uh, um, Let's, uh, sorry, I don't have, okay, let's get back here, share the screen. All right, yes. we're on again. Uh, you can see how ornate uh, the inside of the house is. Um, uh, even to the extent of, of these very, very fine European style uh, wooden decorations. This is one of the art books um, uh, that uh, uh, was produced about old Damascus with pictures of the house. A more recent book uh, is about the Beit Farhi, the same Farhi of Alan Farhi of Les Fleurs de Lorient, well, the Farhi was also an important Jewish family uh, in uh, Damascus uh, during that time. And you see, the, the book is actually entitled The Sephardic Palaces of Ottoman Damascus. Really quite incredible uh, buildings. Um, the book describes a secret underground passage um, uh, that there was between the Beit Lisbona and the uh, uh, Farhi house. Um, the, the house was actually uh, first built in about 1810, 1820. Um, uh, the, uh, this historian, this art historian has determined uh, that uh, renovations were done in 1864, 1865 for the equivalent of two million pounds sterling nowadays to get an impression of how, you know, this, how, uh, what a big house this was and, and, and how impressive. Um, uh, look at this photo of the house. Um, at, least, at least some of the people here are definitely my family members. Uh, interestingly enough that it was absolutely the custom of uh, rich Jewish women also to smoke a hookah. You can see this woman in the in the in the in the picture uh, smoking her hookah. Um, uh, here's another picture from this book of the interior uh, of the house. You can see on the right hand side. You can see there's a uh, a, a Jewish uh, inscription an inscription in in Hebrew. So, as I said, we're very lucky to have the contribution of various art 
uh, historians. This is one of them, uh, a woman called uh, Anke Scharachs, who is a, a, a German art historian. And you can see this has gone uh, far and wide. She was one of the main people who recreated in Germany, in the city of Dresden, a room which re recreates one of the uh, uh, rooms of the, these Jewish palaces in Damascus. So there's one of these in Germany. Uh, one of these has been recently um, recreated in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles County of uh, uh, County Museum of Art. Um, and uh, her, uh, this Anke Scharach's uh, uh, PhD was about the interiors of the 17th to 19th century private homes of which um, the Lisbonas was a prime example. Um, because it was such a, uh, an impressive house, it drew impressive visitors. Um, the Emperor of Brazil visited in 1832. Uh, there are uh, Portuguese records to this. In 1862, the then uh, uh, British Prince of Wales uh, visited. And here on the right side, you can see it's a little faded, but this is the, uh, uh, the excerpt from the, uh, from the Jewish Chronicle of the time and the, the, his, uh, 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 his Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales in Damascus. And he, he honored with his presence the, uh, pri uh, the private residence of one of the Jewish inhabitants, uh, Mr. Lisbona. Um, there was a, a, an explorer in uh, 1858 who also wrote one of these handbook for travelers because people in, in the West loved reading these stories. And he writes in a very nice way. Uh, 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 he says a few uh, of these Jewish houses have been... Um, uh, uh, have been decorated at enormous expense, but they are uh, wanting in taste. The Lisbonas and the Fahi are amongst the best. Uh, if possible, they should be visited on Saturday. That being the Jewish Sabbath, they will be found clean and their fair inmates will be seen bl all blazing with gold and jewels. So that's a nice... Uh, a nice little sort of picture to have. Um, um, this is a postcard, an actual postcard from 1902. It obviously wasn't photographed in color, but as was the, the, uh, the style of the time, a black and white post postcard was, was, was colored. But again, you can see the same features of the, of the house that we, uh, that we saw before. Uh, here we have a map from one of the art books of uh, the old city of, uh, this is the old city of, of Damascus. The bottom sort of the south uh, east quarter was the Jewish uh, quarter. Here we see it in greater uh, detail. And here we can see on the map uh, the Beit Lisbona is marked and it is square. Um, uh, it is on the boundary of the Jewish quarter. And it's said that uh, uh, because Mayor Lisbona was such an important local dignitary and a member of the Majlis, the, the local parliament, that his house could exceptionally have an entrance uh, also from uh, the street outside the, uh, the Jewish quarter. Um, we can still see it here. This is Google Maps, uh, Google Maps of the Jewish quarter. And you can see in exactly the same place as it was. Here is this huge square compound, 19 rooms still there. Um, I managed to get hold of a uh, a map of the historical sites of Damascus, which was produced about 15 years ago. And you see Beit Lasbuna, uh, spelled a little diff differently in English here, um, still marked as, as a uh, site of importance. Um, 
fast forward yet again, and this is from 2016. And if you think about it, this is really amazing. In the middle of the Syrian civil war, somebody in Syria posted on a Syrian website a photo of the, uh, of the building or of part of the building and explains that it used to be a, uh, uh, a Jewish school. Um, uh, one of the incredible developments of the last it few years. There is a group on uh, uh, Facebook called Humans of Damascus, where there are lots of Syrians, both exiles and Syrians living in Syria today, who are on there, and one of them posted uh, this photo from the Damascus Encyclopedia. Uh, the person who subtitled the photo made a mistake uh, and wrote 1979, but the photo is in fact from 1879. Um, Obviously, members of my family, the unfortunate thing is that I, I don't know who the people are uh, in the photo, but it's pretty amazing to be able to receive uh, nowadays a photo which was put on by a present day uh, Syrian. Uh, even in, the, in today's history books, here is a, a, hist a history book written in Syria about five years ago about the Jews of the, of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and this is a very interesting phenomenon in various Arab countries that the locals are taking an interest in the Jewish communities, even though these Jew Jewish communities don't exist or hardly exist anymore. Uh, here's another picture from 1872 uh, uh, with the, the fountain and the and the courtyard. Uh, here we have a photo of a wedding in the Lisbona house in 1870, in 1890, everybody in their, in their finery. Um, uh, on the religion side, religious side, uh, the Lisbonas were not particularly, I believe, religious, but because they were community leaders and very rich, they obviously had to um, uh, uh, subsidize and to pay for uh, synagogues and the Lisbona family was one of the founders and main funders of the Alfrange synagogue in Damascus, which is the only one that is still standing. And uh, here we'll just have a look for a, a couple of minutes at the Uh, this is a, a film that was taken in uh, 2016 of the synagogue. Oh, there are still some Jews living there. Yeah, there are. There are, some, there, there are still a few Jews. There are still a few Jews uh, mm -hmm. living, but ve but very very few. Um, so coming back to my uh, family story, uh, here's a picture of my great grandfather uh, Abraham Lisbona and his wife and one of his daughters. The photo is taken in Alexandria in um, 1879, but they're in, in full sort of classic, typical Ottoman uh, dress. By contrast, I told you that his brother moved to Manchester in the same year in 1875. And uh, this is a picture of the Manchester uh, side of the family uh, taken in, in 1893. Uh, a few no noteworthy Lisbonas of the 20th century. There was one of the British branch of the Lisbonas who uh, 
uh, served in the First World War and was killed in France. Uh, Nissim Lisbona, uh, from the same branch, uh, there was a quite a famous uh, British sa uh, jazz singer and songwriter, uh, Eddie Lisbona, um, and from the uh, Mayor Lisbona branch, uh, there was Sadok Lisbona, um, uh, which is an interesting story. He was a member of the Haganah in Israel. Uh, he was the uh, branch manager of the Barclays Bank in Haifa in 1947. Uh, the Etzel decided to mount a raid on the bank. He resisted the Etzel uh, bank robbers uh, and they shot him. And uh, one of the documented tragedies of the, of the whole sort of pre-Israel, uh, pre-independence period. Um, um, this is a, a photograph of my grandfather's birth certificate issued by the rabbinate in uh, Alexandria. Uh, he was born in, in 1880. Uh, he decided to emigrate uh, and uh, made his way to Germany. He wanted to emigrate to the USA, but he ended up in Germany. Uh, he founded a cigarette mating, making factory. So in Berlin in the 1930s, there was the Lisbona cigarette factory. He had to leave Germany because of the Nazis, um, went back to Egypt. My father joined him in Egypt. Uh, there's a picture of my father and grandmother in front of the, the, the pyramids. And in due course, my father joined the Royal Air Force uh, and became a pilot in the Royal Air Force and settled down in the UK, which was where I was born. Uh, so that's basically it. There's still a lot to find out, a lot of holes in the story. Um, maybe DNA testing can give stuff. Uh, there are not good records um, uh, at all. There are definitely archives in Damascus, but how easy they are to access is, is, uh, is not sure at all. There are definitely Ottoman archives in Istanbul, but they're in old Turkish, which is not modern Turkish. So it, it requires um, mm -hmm. absolutely um, uh, sort of special people to, to, to look at them. I'd very much like to have a look at the um, uh, archives of the Venice uh, Jewish ghetto uh, because the family had Venetian uh, nationality. Uh, I'd also have liked to have a look at the, the archives of the Venetian Republic. Um, uh, at the time, I told you about Lydia Collins, uh, um, who I believe is online as well with us today. Uh, she and her partners, Morris Biabria uh, did research in the Austrian and, and French archives. So um, uh, that's my story. Thanks a lot for uh, listening. And I'm uh, um, open for questions and, uh, and comments and whatever. Thank you. Th th thank you, that was absolutely fascinating. Can I yeah. first of all ask about the relationship that existed between the Safadim, the, the Franco community and the Mustaravi community? I mean, did they keep uh, separate? I mean, I, I, I don't speak Arabic, is al Franj? I, I don't know, that stands for a Franco synagogue yeah. as opposed to an indigenous. Did they marry between the communities or, or, or how did it work? I, I, they, I, the, they, didn't, they didn't marry between the communities primarily because of class. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the Mustarabim were mostly craftsmen. Uh, you know, of a, you know, low, much, much lower uh, socioeconomic class. Uh, and I think it was primarily a, um, uh, a, a class thing. Uh, I'd be, in, be interested if anybody else uh, listening has any uh, sort of uh, knowledge or speculation about that. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know whether you noticed in the names of the, on the family trees, there were 
several intermarriages between the Lisbonas and the Falchis and the Hararis and the Stambulis. So in the way, you know, that families of a certain uh, higher socioeconomic level tend to hang out together and intermarry because that's what the, the families want. So I think it was two fairly separate communities. I mean, even to the extent that when I met some of the, in Tel Aviv, some of the descendants of the Mustarabim, uh, I, I felt that there was a certain kind of distance. You know, we were sort of, you know, the, the aristocracy as it were, and they were the, they were the ordinary folk. Okay, on um, Facebook, um, Kevin is, is mentioning refugees uh, from Spain and Portugal who, who went directly, um, directly there. I assume he's talking about Aleppo and Damascus. Do you, do you know anything about that? Uh, no, I mean, some, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the families definitely came uh, directly or with very... Uh, with very short stopovers in, uh, let's say, in, in, in Italy or in Turkey on the way. Well, what was the language of the, uh, the Franco community in Damascus? I mean, what did people speak at home? Oh, people spoke, uh, people spoke Arabic. Spoke okay. Arabic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Tor uh, Ton, um, have you been following the uh, the chat? I'm not sure. Yes, uh, uh, there were a few questions about uh, the women of the family. Are there any stories about them? Um, no, I mean they. Uh, uh, you know, from what I've read, they 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 led a life. Of, they led a life of leisure, uh, um, uh, and. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I've heard some sort of interesting story. As I told you, the house had 19 rooms um, and it was occupied at different times by different parts of the, uh, the family. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, you can ask yourself how these different families, part of this greater clan, actually got together with this one uh, you know, got along together with this one uh, communal courtyard. Do, do we know if the women were literate? Oh, sorry, Serena, Serena Roffi has, has just made a comment, sorry, it, um, jumped up and then disappeared. I'll just, just read it. Uh, women stayed at home, no education unless private for women. Women did not did not shop, extended lives to live together. So so is is, is, is that what we're saying, that they're just... Um, uh, sort of artifacts, <laughs> elegant artifacts living at home. Um, That's right. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I could, mm -hmm. she, she then mentions until the Alliance um, arrived in the 19th century. But, but is that the case? Would, would rich ladies not, not be literate, for example? Do we know? I mean, did they sign Ketubot or documents? Oh, I think they would have been literate, but they, they would have had private teachers. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question about uh, trade. What did the family trade in? I, I don't know. I don't know. I wish I knew. Uh, David, maybe you can unmute uh, Adam Brown. He says he has some interesting uh, okay. stuff about DNA. Done. Uh, about the Lisbona family. Hi, all. Adam, you are unmuted. How are you all today? This was David. That was wonderful. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, many years ago, David was part of starting um, a DNA project with Ellen Farhi, and uh, we've had a chance over the years to look at the Y DNA for the Lisbono family, and uh, it is incontrovertibly uh, from Iberia because we have uh, many matches to the Lisbonas among uh, men with. Uh, Hispanic surnames in Mexico. Uh -huh. Okay, going and uh, so we know about that. We also have matches to the Lisbona family among uh, known Jewish families in uh, uh, Tunisia, uh, Libya, and Greece. 
And there's also a very large Ashkenazi cohort. So we think we're looking at a family that left um, Iberia at various times and at one time uh, ended up in, uh, in, in East, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, today identifying as Ashkenazi, but undoubtedly originally identifying from elsewhere. So it's a very interesting family and we have DNA uh, showing a branching of the DNA uh, of the Jewish families at least 2000 years ago. So it's a very ancient family that one portion of which found its way to Iberia probably about 18, 1900 years ago. So we do know quite a bit and uh, there's lots more to learn. So that's my, mm. my point on that. Fascinating stuff. Thank you. Um, I, I, I saw that uh, Noah um, earlier was mentioning that some Lisbonas appear in the uh, Livorno um, Ketu Bart. Um, I, I was just curious, you, you, you mentioned a family called uh, Tovi, uh, and, and in my family we have this mysterious Tubi family which seems to live in every single country of the world. I just, do, do, you, do you know anything about the Tovis and who they might have been? No, no I don't. Okay, well that's, that's yeah. standard, standard. It's not a name that I came along uh, as part of those who had intermarried yeah. at some point. Yeah, you mentioned the Stambuli family. Yeah, uh, one of the four had, synagogues in Jerusalem. A, 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 a very can you can you um, so sorry, David? Can you can you stop the screen share so that we can see you full screen? Sure. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you mentioned the Stambuli family and one of the four synagogues, Sephardi synagogues in Jerusalem, is called the Stambuli synagogue. Is there a relation to the family or is it, is it just a general reference to Istanbul? I mean, there, there was a very significant Stambuli family in uh, Damascus, also in, um, in Manchester, as a result of that wave of, of uh, uh, Sfadi Middle East emigration to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Manchester. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know about the Jerusalem connection. Okay. I think that's about it, uh, David Mendoza, in this case. Okay, um, do you want to, to close? I'm afraid yeah. I don't have the, uh, the file on my, my computer. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so, next week... Sidney Caucus will be with us and he will talk about uh, Moroccan family history and he will talk about diverse Moroccan uh, families, uh, among them his own. And uh, we are looking forward to that. Then, as always, we are grateful to our Patreons. You can become a Patreon as well and help us cover our costs. Uh, visit us at patreon.com slash And David and I also uh, provide professional help with your research. Please contact us through contact at sephardicgenealogy.com. And uh, that's it for today. We are very grateful to David Lisbona for taking the time and the effort to talk with us and uh, well, maybe he will be back again someday about the Jews of Egypt and uh, thank you to all our viewers. Yeah, thank you. It was an excellent today. talk. And we, uh, we, we, we hope you get your house back in Damascus at some point. It would be rather nice to, uh, to have Yes, I mean, you know, if I, could, I could take the car from Haifa and, and be in Damascus in about an hour and a half. Oh, please God, uh, please God soon. So, you know, uh, as soon as somebody tells me that uh, they have the keys, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be more than happy to it. I... I, a, a relative of mine uh, from um, Australia uh, visited Damascus about 10 years ago and saw the house boarded up from the outside 
And as soon as they started asking questions about the family, uh, they were sort of shut up and asked to move on.